Stafford is traditionally the opener to the show season and it's the first chance for the clubs to come along and to meet up and for the manufacturers to come along and show off just some of the products that they've been working on over the close season. Yeah, there's been a lot of rumours this year about uh, new cars in the offing that were going to be announced at this show. Two that we know of certainly is the new Diablo replica mm -hmm. and of course there's the Ultima GTR. Well we're going to get in there and have a look around and check out some of these things and Virginia Baker is here as well somewhere. Yes, Richard, I'll be visiting the club areas and meeting up with some very enthusiastic owners, so make sure you join me a little later on. And the new Extreme should be here, which will be worth a drive. Oh. And uh, did you mention the, uh, the new Ultima, Ben? Ultima, well, well I might have done. New um, one. Could be worth new, checking out, isn't it? Really? GTR, it's yeah. It's in there, obviously. Yeah, Look at that there. What, 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 what? Yes, I got it for once. You might remember that in the show not long ago, actually, Penn had a go in the Ultima and thought it was fantastic. And it is. This is the new GTR. Well, the changes are immediately visible from the outside. Uh, to the rear, there's this new rear end, which drops off a little more steeply. It's a little squarer rather than the old curved one. That's been generally acclaimed here at the show as quite an improvement. Then at the other end, there's new headlamps, new headlamp covers. It's all very sleek. But the really good news is that the changes and improvements aren't only on the outside. They're underneath as well. Nineteen sixty two. I was fifteen, this man was world champion. It's Jim Clark. At the time he was driving some revolutionary motor cars designed by Colin Chapman. He was driving a twenty one. This is a Lotus twenty three. He also drove this very, very quickly. Been three replicas of this so far. Sutol, Xanthos, Noble twenty three, all been space frame chassis. Sadly, the problem with that is that it's not as per the original. This is a proper original car in the respect that it's a monocoque chassis, Zintex steel plated, proper suspension as per the original, and in here, of course, you've got a proper mid-engine configuration. Alpha 33, great power unit, Alpha transaxle, great gearbox. Sensational as per the original, a properly laid out motor car. I'll bet you it handles like hell. I'd love to try it sometime. New for the show, at 9,000 pounds for a fully built car, I don't think you can go wrong and I think this is the best one so far. Now here's a car that will be familiar to you. We've actually seen it grow right through from design and concept through the prototype and to this, the production version. It's the Quantum Extreme. If you remember, we drove the prototype on the program and changes between that and this are actually pretty minimal. We've got a new GRP bonnet rather than the stainless steel item we saw on the prototype. And other than that, it's pretty much as is. Apart from the fact that it feels perhaps a little better screwed together, the dash feels a little more substantial in here, the cockpit generally feels pretty nicely trimmed out. It's a nice place to be and the car's been getting a lot of admiring glances throughout the day which is good for Quantum. So that's something new. Now Penn has been out and about finding something that's nearly as old as he is. One of the things you find at kit car shows, just come across a little historic display of some very very nice cars indeed and very very historic at that. This little baby here, 1965 Rochdale Olympic Phase 2. Extensively modified in its time, but nevertheless, it still retains its original fiberglass monocoque, which was like revolutionary at the time. This one's got an 1800 MGB engine, gearbox, and drivetrain. Right, lovingly restored, used every day. It's a proper car. Bit 356 Porsche in its uh, in its shape, but uh, who's complaining about that? Um, they're worth a lot of money these cars nowadays. They're very very nice. This is good, but this is nicer. In many respects, more historic. This here is a 1962 Ford Falcon. Not the best made car in the world, but nevertheless, for its time, it was pretty good. Ford E93A 1172 side valve engine. The old sit up and beg pop, take the body off, narrow the chassis, stick a new body on it, that's what you got. 1962, quality of fiberglass wasn't too good. Nor was the quality of the interiors, but it's adequate, it does, and it's very, very historic and very, very collectible. You don't see many of these on the road. 
But this over here, this is something very, very special indeed. You don't see too many of these about. This is a Turner. This is a great car. This is a piece of real motoring history and not just kit car motoring history either. These things are immensely competitive in the day. Simple chassis, little ladder frame type chassis, Morris 1000 running gear and also Sprite running gear if you wanted something a bit hot. 1098cc, four speed gearbox, fly off handbrake, all the little racy bits, dead good. Nice bodywork, very, very nearly a production car this. Just didn't quite make it by the skin of its teeth, but it's very, very collectible. And there's quite a few of these about uh, in private hands. And uh, I think there's one in the uh, British Heritage Museum at Gaydon, which is great, but it's lovely to see it just here at this show today. Pity there aren't a few more. Uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. But uh, I think it's about time we went over to see what Virginia's on with. Well, I'm here at the JBA Owners Club, but there's only one car and no owner, so I'm afraid it's back to you guys. Sorry. One of the great things about kit car shows that I love particularly is trawling around the accessory section where you can find all those bits, you know, that you need to finish your kit car. Stuff that you don't get in the kit, you know, or stuff that you maybe want to modify. I mean, look at this little lot here. Look at all these different types of hoses and fuel line. Some really good stuff. Look at this. Practically aircraft quality, that. And dirt cheap, too. And then, of course, you've got all your fittings. You know, look at these nice little things. Look at that. Beautiful. Polish up a treat, that. Moving right along, copper hose, super brake lines, or you can use it for fuel lines, doesn't matter what. And you're coming along here, and you've got all these nice little pumps. Look at this. Sweet little pump, that, isn't it? A uh, little facet type pump. Or you want your electric fuel pump, you've got your facets there. You've got coils, you've got gauges, you've got just about everything you need. Look at this, absolutely vital. Fuel filter, tremendous thing, you know. Dirty old tank, filters all your gear out. What's that going to be? £2.50, it's a bargain. Hmm. One of the things you need, of course, when you're uh, building your kit car, is you put a big engine in it, you might want to upgrade your brakes. Here's the place to get them. Look at all this. MGB brake conversion kit, it's got the lot. Four pot calipers, Whew. lovely stuff. Look at all this, great, nuts and bolts. 10 quid for that, dirt cheap. Very, very reasonable indeed. This four pot, really, really haul you down from some great speeds. And you need it when you start fitting V8 engines in, you know. Mind you, the chassis has got to be up to it. And that's one thing you should always check. This is the Fisher Fury and it started life as a silver, which is interesting because the Fisher company itself started life as agents for silver and as specialist builders. Well, they then took over the Fury project and have begun some development work on what is an excellent car already, mostly cosmetic at the moment. And we went down to Kent to take a proper look. So here we are in deepest, darkest Kent, nestled away in the countryside. We've caught up with the main man, Mark. Mark, Fisher Sports Cars have been very successful manufacturing the Fury and prior to that as agents for silver auto kits. So how did the business evolve to this stage? Fisher Sports Cars really started as a hobby uh, which grew up into a business. Um, I have always had interesting specialist sports cars. Um, I've had a number of Caterhams and in the mid um, 1980s I followed the kit car racing scene where the um, Striker Mark II was doing very well and I ended up buying a kit and building one and was uh, very, very impressed by the um, levels of handling which was certainly comparable to a Caterham. And it all went on from there. It started as a, a hobby where we built cars for, for people and uh, now it's a full-time business employing three people. You retain the agency for silver of a tremendous racing pedigree. Does that mean Fisher Fury has become a major force in motorsport? They already are a strong force in, uh, in motorsport. We have uh, three or four cars running in the 750 Kit Car Championship. And then uh, obviously there are cars running in Sprint Championships and Hill Climb Championships around the country as well. So we hope for great things this year. We have um, uh, a Formula Ford driver racing a Fury in the Kit Car Championship called Andy Charlesley, who I believe is probably going to take the championship. Back to road cars, what does a Fury cost? The average Fury kit starts at about £3,000. Most of our customers spend between £5,000 and £8,000 putting cars on the road. Uh, and obviously then we do any stage of fully built car. 
You've two cars in particular being built for customers with unusual power plants. Tell us about these. Yeah, well, the first one has a, a Rover V8 engine in it. And obviously this is quite a surprising uh, choice of engine for a lightweight sports car. But people love the, the noise and the sheer grunt of a V8. The other one is the Honda Fireblade engine car, which uh, is obviously uh, quite interesting, having a, a very lightweight engine, a very powerful engine, six-speed sequential gearbox. That car's going to be sprinted. And I believe the Fireblade has a lightweight chassis. How heavy is the Fury? The average uh, road car weighs between 580 and 600 kilos. Lightweight racers are down to like 500 kilos. You offer two styling options, the original and your own design. So what led to this? Well, we wanted to offer a variety of uh, body styles. We already produce a standard Fury, which has a windscreen and doors. Um, and obviously with the racing, we wanted to produce a doorless version um, so that led to the Spider tub. And then from there, we've now developed the Le Mans bonnet, which uh, just offers a choice in uh, body style. What are your future plans? Obviously, the product never stands still. We're always um, developing suspension and chassis design through racing. And the quality of body panels items of trim are always being uh, developed and improved so the product never stands still. Finally, Mark, what are you sitting in? I'm sitting in a replica of a 1920s Austin 7 Special. Uh, this was built out of workshop scraps. Oh, blimey, caught me. Look at this lot. Look at that for a quid. Isn't it brilliant? You know, that's what I love about all this. A brush. There you are. Look at this. What have we got here? Plastic caliper for measuring things. A quid. Everything on this table is a quid. I just love it. Look at this. Wait a minute. What have we got here? Brake spanner. Minis mostly. Adjust your brakes. Great. A quid. What else we got? Oh, stuff you're always breaking or losing. Allen keys. Tremendous. A quid. Can't go wrong. Love these shows. Now, not everybody wants to build their own cars, and one company who's made a reputation for themselves for custom cars is Burnham Autos, and we sent our cameras along for a sneaky look. I used to be in the bike trade years ago, and it was a natural progression from there. I did bikes 24 hours a day, then I thought, well, this is getting a bit boring, I started doing cars a little bit. I started to buy myself, I've been doing it 18 years now. I seem to have got a reasonable reputation for myself, so we try and do a good job, that's what counts. Um, we were a lot smaller a couple of years ago. We moved to these premises about two years, two and a half years ago. Um, at the beginning, it was very like, small scale, just a two car garage, and it was all word of mouth. Then we met a chap called Justin who worked for a magazine. A good friend of mine is no longer with us, unfortunately. But he got us some advertising. It started picking up from there. Now we advertise the magazines. It's half word of mouth, it's half from the advert. I asked Paul to um, change out the front suspension unit, got a new cross member, but invented discs complete unit out of a 2.8i uh, Capri. The, uh, the engine's been changed out for a, a 351 Windsor, um, which is a 5.7 litre V8 engine, which is uh, vastly upgraded from the old unit. And the old suspension, being it, old geometry and things like that, it uh, can't put up with the, the extra stresses put on by the new engine. Paul's worked on it before. He helped um, on the, in the finishing stages of uh, fitting out the doors and various other bits and pieces. Um, and all the work he's done on it has been really good, you know, which is why I've returned again. If some jobs come in just for a couple of days, or even a couple of hours work, just to get something sorted out. Other ones come in for a full rebuild, can be here for months, so, or longer. <laughs> Got a variety of cars in at the moment. They range from a 63 Chevy pickup truck, which is for a ground up rebuild. We had it back to bare chassis. Um, we started off as a light rebuild, and as usual, it, it progressed into several more jobs than we wanted, but, that's okay, it looks really good now. He's had 
full paintwork, full interior, he's having digital dashboard. Basically it's going to be a new truck that looks like an old truck. That would be quite nice when it's finished. We've got a 1953 Chevrolet, which was a four-door sedan. It's now a low-wider. It's two-doored, chopped four inches, it's got lowered hydraulic suspension, new paintwork obviously. Lots of little subtle body mods as well and a complete interior it's going to have. Again, it will go out finished. A lot of cars come down, they come down initially just for a small amount of work. Then they say, oh, okay, well, you can do this, oh, we'll have that done, and they save up a bit more money and have a bit more done, which is okay, but they tend to overlap a little bit. Probably about the best car we've actually built so far between us is the Hearst 59 Chevrolet. Um, a Hearst from original actually was a funeral car once in its life. It's got small block Chevrolet engine and it's supercharged, which <laughs> isn't the norm, but it is quite common these days. But it's got lots of trick stuff as well. The more you look at the car, the more you'll see. It's got hydraulic suspension, it's got a complete stainless exhaust system, it's got a really wicked stereo that you can't see until you start opening panels up. In the back it's got lift up panels, they're all pneumatics, so you can't see any of the linkage, it all works by remote control. It's trick, it's very nice. You have the exhaust has got flamethrowers built in the end. Probably not completely street legal, but <laughs> definitely good fun at a car show. Basically they've got spark plugs in the exhaust system right near the end of the pipe. You rev the car up, you hit the switch, it kills the ignition. While the engine's dying, you're still pumping fuel around. When the fuel gets to the end, the spark plugs are alight, flames. Ambition? To become financially stable. It's very hard to make a living. I mean, everyone will think, I'm just saying it, but every job is time consuming. You do find it hard to justify how long things take sometimes. Therefore, it's always a bit on a tight budget, financially. I'd like to have my own premises and just keep working, really. Just keep enjoying it. Hope I don't lose that. A new car is always an important time for any company, particularly in this industry, when they've only got a limited number of cars. Roger Lee is the main man, the senior partner here. Uh, before we come on to your new car, The Shadow, yes. briefly tell me what this one has done for you. What's it done to establish your company? Right. Well, that's the Vindicator Sprint. Yep. We've been producing them for 10 years now. It's established us in the market. It's been a company you can trust and deal with happily. Yeah, you would say that, yeah, obviously. obviously. Fair enough. <laughs> well, you're moving on to The Shadow now, the new yep. one, which you can see here. Quite an aggressive looking thing. That's Quickly right. talk us through, what have we got here? Uh, uh, it's basically based on, on the same floor plan and, yep. and backbone chassis as the Sprint. So we're, we're developing from there onwards upwards. Uh, we want to bring a, a nice, if you like, civilised sports car out that you could use every day. We like civilised, that's nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, that one is great, but... A bit raw. For everyday use, yes. Right. Uh, this one, you've got the hard top option or yep. soft top option. And what about the running gear? What have we got underneath it? Yeah, well, basically it's Ford Sierra. Right. Uh, but you can go right through up to the row of V8. It's going to be an uh, awful lot of engine in a car this size. Yep. With your pricing, you're saying build one yourself for under £7,000. It sounds like not a lot of cash, but you're into quantum territory realistic. That's aren't right, you? yeah. I mean, so um, you're going to have to be pretty sharp with this beast. Yeah, they are. I mean, the difference with this is for someone who wants something that's like a traditional sports car. It's rear-wheel drive, front engine set. Now, a while ago, David Greenwood went out to check out one of the best-known kit cars in the country. Here's what he got up to. We're often asked which car we would recommend as a first-time build. Well, you can't go wrong with a Westfield. Let's face it, if you can't build one of these, you shouldn't be thinking of a self-build car. The components are absolute quality, and the GRP bodywork is so smooth and ripple-free, and, well, not unattractive. Topping all that is a build manual which is probably more legible than some manuals from major manufacturers. The side screens, if you want to, are very easy to remove. But let's face it, you don't buy this car for garage decoration. You buy it to drive it. Now I asked the producer for a hat and look what he gave me. I'm going to go and drive him over. This is a stock Westfield 1800 speed sport. The brutal models might get more press coverage, but with this sort of performance, you'll see off any hot hatch. Insurance will, as with most kits, be a lot less expensive than even the donor car it's based on. Residuals will also be better. There's healthy demand for built Westies, so you should get most of your build cost back. Of course, you won't be watching this bodywork rust away. What you will be watching is down the bonnet where it all happens. Just sit back and enjoy the ride.
still not sure, we can build this car for between six and eight thousand pound. And when you've built it, Westfield will take you to the factory and give it a good once over. Any mistakes you've made will be corrected for you. Once that's done, you'll get Westfield's full seal of approval. This is definitely our recommended first build car. If you're interested in anything in today's programme, send for a free fact sheet. Make sure you enclose a large self-addressed envelope with two first-class stamps, tickets and cruising, Men and Motors, Granada TV, Manchester, M60, 9EA. Peter, this is rather a busy time for you, of course, because you've organised it. Yes, um, it's uh, the first show of the year for the season and um, we've been involved in organising it and uh, it's been a fairly heavy day. Yeah. Let's just take time, if we can, to take a quick look back. You introduced the idea of, of publishing, really, to the kit car industry, so you've had a good overview for, well, we shan't say how many years, but quite a few. During that time, it's changed massively. In what ways, fundamentally, does it differ now from how it was when you started? Um, I think the, the, major, the major thing is quality. Um, we started our first magazines in 1979 and um, it was very much a sort of embryonic industry at that time. A lot of the cars were very simple and very badly finished and, and indeed they were seen as cheap sports cars. But over the years the big thing that's changed is quality, uh, safety, road holding, handling uh, and other backup things like accessory supplies, uh, build-up manuals, which of course is really important for the guy who's going to build his own car. He's got to have a comprehensive manual. Um, and the professionalism. And I, I would say it took at least the first 10 years for that to develop. And of course that message then has to be communicated. So what can continue to be done? to really, I suppose, overcome people's prejudices or people are going to say, don't put your money into the kit car industry because mm. they might be here today mm. and gone tomorrow and there's no mm. comeback. I think, I think we've got to convince people that kit cars are pure quality these days. They're anything from low-cost sports cars through to 200 mile an hour supercars. It takes years and years for an image to change. So I think if we can get more help from a wider media, then we can get this message across. Well, that's it from Stafford, and we can certainly say that the kit car show season is well and truly underway for this year. Yep, and the next one's at Stonely, and that is the biggest show of the year. So right eye Stedford, and of course, kits and cruising will be there. Certainly will be. Don't panic, though, because the show continues, and in the meantime, you can join us next week. That was all right, that. That wasn't about too shabby. Yeah, at least I think day. we got it right. Hey, I have it, you're hey, you're right. Yeah, great. So, you're not getting I'm... yourself in trouble, Pen. Not too much. No, you, you know. did, actually. You just yeah, I... photographs. It was... Uh,